Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you might be around the world. Thank you for joining today's Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you uh, for taking the time out of your day. I know uh, these are hectic and crazy times, and hopefully all of you are safe. And uh, I'm glad you're able to join, and let's do a little bit of learning in this Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer with Wim Hemshrek. My name is Eric Neighberg, and uh, I'll be your host today. I run uh, marketing operations here for Scrum.org. Uh, this series is, is a series that we continue to run on a monthly basis to give you, uh, those using Scrum, an opportunity to ask one of our professional Scrum trainers, one of our experts, for help, for guidance, and to help you continue to learn. Uh, just briefly, who is Scrum.org for those of you new? Uh, Scrum.org provides training, certification, and, and resources to help you uh, learn and grow as, as you continue to deal with uh, situations in, in having to apply Scrum. We're founded by Ken Schwaber, the co-creator of Scrum, and he continues to uh, lead our organization as our chairman. And with that, I will uh, let Wim uh, introduce himself. Wim? Yes, thank you, Eric. So yeah, I'm Wim Hengskerk, and uh, yeah, what am I about? Yeah, I guess I, I like how our work becomes more and more human these days. The industrial paradigm is just falling behind us. It doesn't work anymore. We now get most value by embracing what we can do as people. And in my work, I, um, I pay specific attention to uh, leadership as a driving force, as well as how to unleash everyone, or facilitation, as you might call it. And I'm also, well, of course, a, a scrum trainer, otherwise I would not be here. Yeah, and I have come, come a bit of a circle. I was trained in management back in the day. I became a web developer, got interested in testing, did keep that interest in process around. And now more and more I find myself uh, uh, working and figuring out how we can improve organizations, including the structure and the leadership and all those aspects of it. That's me. Excellent. Thank you, Ben. And uh, just some quick guidelines. Uh, ask your questions. Your, your um, microphones will be muted, uh, but please uh, use the questions tab on the GoToWebinar browser to ask your questions, and we'll take them as they come in. And uh, I think we're ready to go. We've got some coming in already. Um, and here's one that I'm sure is uh, near and dear to everybody's heart right now with, uh, with, with so much distribution going on in the workforce. Uh, so, Vim, uh, if team members work in different countries or different time zones, how, how do you synchronize the Scrum events, especially when you start running into then time zone differences and, and public holidays and the like? With difficulty? <laughs> um, how do you synchronize them? Well, I, I, I hope that in most teams you would be able to find some common ground. So, uh, Yes, one misunderstanding that I hear a lot in uh, uh, come up in the trainings is that the, the daily scrum, for example, should be the start of your day. Well, it's going to be very hard if people are in different locations. Uh, and while that's, that's a, a good idea, if that fits, that's, there's no need to really do that. The main idea is to have uh, one of those every, uh, every work day at a fixed time because, well, that makes it a nicely ingrained habit. You don't need to think about it. Um, so hopefully you would be able to find a time that works for for everyone in the in the team, and I think the same sort of goes for the uh, for the other scrum events. Yeah, just, just find the time that that suits you and and, and go with that. Or perhaps I'm not reading enough into the question, but no, I I, I think I think you had it. Um, it, it, it it's. It's not an easy question, but at the same time, there, there's only one solution, which is the team has to get together, right, and, and figure yeah, it out. Yeah, be practical about it. And I would also still, well, we don't do that right now, but I, I generally recommend to get close to each other on a regular basis. Excellent. Thank you. So the next question, uh, Steve asks, uh, what's the difference between a scrum master and an agile coach? Ah, well, thank you for that one, Steve. Yeah. Well, I like what uh, what the folks at Spotify put on their blog a couple of years ago. They had a lot of Scrum Masters in the Spotify organization. And uh, however, uh, Scrum wasn't mandatory there. So you had some teams that weren't doing Scrum and um, did have a Scrum Master, and that was confusing. 
So while, of course, as a scrum trainer, I like teams to do scrum in general, um, their solution was a very practical one. They renamed the scrum masters to agile coaches. Done. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit resistant to all this notion of, uh, uh, of hierarchy. There, there really isn't one. Uh, scrum master already has uh, duties to, to help the organization as a whole along as well. It's not specifically limited to the, uh, to the team that he's the scrum master of. So there isn't, there isn't really much of a difference, in my opinion. But if you get hired better on LinkedIn, if you call yourself an agile coach, well, why not? Who cares? And, and, and yeah, and, and remembering that uh, in the Scrum Guide, uh, it talks about the role of the Scrum Master. It's not a job title. Um, yeah. it, it is truly a role. Great. So uh, next question, uh, truce, uh, whoops. Uh, how, how do you ensure the Scrum framework is enacted to its true spirit, uh, especially when uh, delivery-based leadership teams feel that Scrum is just the process and, and continue with their existing structure and meetings? Uh, do you have any experiences that you can share on, on how, to, how to get leadership on board to, to truly believe that we are, doing some, we are doing Scrum and it's not just business as usual? <laughs> yeah, well, there, there's one anecdote that, that comes to my mind. I was uh, uh, hired to work with a, a, a newly starting team that was working between two, uh, two parts of an organization that were organizationally very widely separated. Um, in, 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 the, in real life, so to say, there was a whole bicycle lane between their two buildings. So yeah, that was, that was of course, a huge gap. And um, both of the senior leaders from both ends that I, that I was working there were insistent that the proper governance structure should be set up. They needed a proper governance structure. They needed a proper governance meeting. So I said, yeah, sure, come to the review, come to the sprint reviews. And they were immediately hugely resistant to that. No, no, not the demo, not the demo. We need a proper, a proper governance meeting. So, okay, well, I learned uh, later how they did their, their demos, the thing that they associated with sprint review, and that was indeed a quite a massive demo, multiple teams quickly after one another. Um, uh, attendance was sort of mandatory because it took over the whole room where they were all working, et cetera. So, okay, I could see that association. So we uh, had a, a governance meeting. Uh, I think we had two or three. And after that, we everybody understood that it was the sprint review and how the sprint review actually worked. And it worked really well there with those major stakeholders in. And we got to rename it back to sprint review. So that's one, one partial thing uh, there. Um, another thing is if you do this, you will see that these, these scrum events are, when they are done in addition to other things, they're sort of meaningless. So you will definitely get a lot of complaints from the teams in my experience, that what the heck are we doing? This, uh, this ceremony is then suddenly called a ceremony, definitely not worthy the title event anymore to anyone. Why are we doing the ceremonies? So that's something you can look into then. Why are you doing those ceremonies and how can they become meaningful events? And then they will themselves start figuring out which other things they, they are replacing actually. Um, but there is often the need to prove that you uh, have an effective something in place before the whole thing can be demolished. That's at least is my experience. So just start bringing it into the events and then see if you can remove the old meetings that have no use anymore. Great. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so th this, I think, kind of comes similar, similar vein question, but I think it's a good kind of follow on. How do you organize the chaos of beginners? Uh, getting commitment to Scrum at all levels, um, bad team estimations, matrix teams, um, different issues. So, so I think um, what Octavia is kind of getting at here from a leadership perspective and as a Scrum master, how do you go about dealing with the chaos, especially when you're just first getting started with Scrum? Yeah, so I think the, the answer to that is just enough. You know, we, we all have a, a somewhat limited tolerance for chaos. If it gets too big, we, we, we just don't subscribe to the whole thing anymore when we start to diss it. Um, so yeah, to me, it's always how much chaos are people uh, willing and able to tolerate. And I tend to, to walk a very fine line there because as much as you let that uh, well chaos erupt you're also giving space at the same time for people to self-organize and, and find their own ways etc 
Um, but in some settings that may at the start be, be very limited. If you're starting in a setting that is very much used to very strict rules, etc. Um, yeah, there is something to be said for stepping in as the scrum master and saying, okay, we're going to do scrum here. And this is exactly how it works. And you're going to play it exactly how the way I tell you. Just really be aware that that is a starting point. You, you can already feel that that is not very self-organizing in the long-term sense. But if that's what needed to, to shake people out of their uh, present routines and habits and into new ones, there is a, there, there is, um, there is value in, in just creating some muscle memory there and just creating new habits. The only um, main pitfall there is that you cannot you can only do that to the extent that you're getting space. If you're just shouting there in some side from the sidelines that that's what you would like to do and nobody listens, uh, then change your strategy to something more gradual, because you will uh, you will not be creating muscle memory if people don't actually do it. Great. So uh, I, I think we've got a theme here. Uh, the, the, the next question, uh, Sander, I asks is uh, kind of tied to this as well. Uh, one of, one of the biggest challenges for leaders is to change, to do the right thing, change the culture um, and evolve that culture. What are some of the most important things that you do or, or that you have seen leaders do to help empower and enable this change? Yeah, so, so one thing we, uh, traditionally speaking, and, and much of that is more associated with management than with leadership, I guess, it's, it's about telling people what they should do. And we're stepping away from that. We're giving people space to find the proper thing uh, in which to do the proper thing themselves and, and finding out that what that is without necessarily a, a, a hierarchical manager being involved because you have the direct information. You should be more able to do that and, and first have to pass that up and, and get something back down again. Um, but for managers, that's a very scary process. If you're, if you're just going to abandon all all rules and all traditional governments, you, you will in many organizations find yourself in exactly the chaos that you fear. Uh, and that was mentioned in the previous question. Um, but the, the danger you have there is that you then say, okay, let people prove themselves and then I'll give them some space. But how are you going to prove yourself if you have no space? So this is about uh, keeping it safe to fail. You do have to hand over some control. That, that, and it might feel scary, but it has to be an amount that people can actually do something with and, and, and prove themselves with in that sense towards you so that you feel like, okay, I might even be able to give you a next thing. And at the same time, it has to be an amount that, that doesn't let the, uh, uh, let the firm collapse suddenly. So I like what um, both Jurgen Aplo and David Marquet are doing with delegation. They're saying this isn't a black or white thing, but let's just put that into uh, into seven different levels from uh, not delegated at all to fully delegated. And I don't even want to know about it as your superior. Um, that gives you the option to, to, to slowly step away on very, and you can also do that topic by topic. So make it less black and white, take smaller steps, but be, be prepared as the leader to take the first step, or at least as the manager who now holds all the, um, all the keys all in his hand. Excellent. So uh, the next one, this one's kind of a little bit uh, dear to me because I've had this conversation uh, a little bit with, with Ken. Uh, okay. are, are, are process improvements a mandatory element of the sprint backlog? And if so, uh, do these need to be estimated like other PBIs? And I'll just say, um, you know, I, so this is something that was new in the 2017 version of the Scrum Guide, um, where Ken added that, that all process, um, that, that at least one process improvement must uh, be added to the sprint backlog every sprint. And I actually asked him this question as to, well, why? If we're always improving, why would we do this? And Ken's simple answer was, if you give the product owner a choice of improving how the team works or adding a new feature, the product owner is always going to add a new feature. So let's make sure that they're considering process improvement and team improvement as well, and not just focused on, on delivering new product features. But do you have some opinions and thoughts on this, Vim? And um, certainly around um, how, how would we estimate this or should we even estimate it? Yeah, so I, I guess the question of whether any Every product owner would think that way is, is a different one. It depends on what, what long-term point of view the product owner, I suppose, takes and how 
well you've been able to take uh, to take them along in, into how these processes actually work. But in terms of should you have an item, an improvement item on your sprint backlog every sprint, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit torn by this by the fact that there's no one directly visible than talking to because my, my question to, to him or her is okay, but if you don't, what's the point of having retrospectives at all if you don't because you, you, you're not changing anything? Um, yeah, I guess that we're, we're right back at the fundamental uh, pillars of this empirical process uh, management that, um, uh, that Scrum is an, an implementation of. We, we want transparency, we want inspection, but we also want adaption. If you're just putting in a thermometer and saying, ah, oh, this is darn hot, that's, that's a waste of time if you're not doing anything with that. So yes, you definitely want to have an item on every uh, an improvement in every sprint. Now onto the fact of estimating that. Yeah, I wouldn't make too big a circus of it, but isn't it a fair question from a product owner to say, okay, but isn't this is this going to take all sprints? <laughs> you might even have one of those feared uh, tech debt reduction or re-architecting sprints if that's the case, which we really don't like. You should you not get into the situation where you so desperately need that. Um, or is it smaller than that? What's, what's roughly the size? So yeah, I think it's a reasonably fair question. You also want to, you also, depending on your circumstances, might still want to forecast how much space there is in the rest of the sprint. So yeah, why wouldn't you want to have some idea of how much time you're going to spend on your improvement? Excellent, thank you. So uh, we're getting into some technical questions now. Uh, what ways? Like what ways do you do you structure your Scrum team or, or Scrum in general uh, if it's he technically heavy uh, in a domain, say DBAs, uh, when other team members' skills are, are not as deep uh, in the DBA technical domain, as, as an example? So the question is how I would structure them. Uh, yeah. So do do you have any suggestions or recommendations on on, on team structure? Avoid it is my main recommendation. So the idea is that, that um, we, we don't really recognize sub roles and we do that very, very much on purpose because we do want to have uh, people who's, who's, uh, of whom DBA in this example is not the main, their main specialty to also be able to pitch in in a meaningful way when, when there's a lot, a lot of DBA work. And uh, rather than uh, assign everything to the DBA and run out of capacity, you would say, hey team, how can we solve this? And they'll probably come up with ways in which the DBA helps other people to uh, to shine in this area to an extent that was uh, previously not possible, but will definitely lean heavily on those specialists that you have. That's why they have that skill set. Um, but it, this is very much one that, that you really need to take to the team. You're not going to self-organize around that if you're going to pre-self-organize that. So be careful with what amount of suggestions you insert into that process. Great, thank you. Just hold um, them accountable for producing a result. That's that's the main thing. Exactly, and it's a team, right? And not everybody's yeah. going to have the same skills on the team. That's just not realistic. That's also actually a, a, the, the lower boundary for you probably need three people on a scrum team is specifically because we believe you need that diversity in there. So, uh, so no, it's that not about having identical people, not at all, but at the same time, it's about functioning and producing stuff as a, delivering as a team. Exactly. So uh, on the next question, and, and I, th I think you've got experiences here. Um, if not, we, we can pass on it. But uh, do you have any experience working with non-IT organizations or non-IT teams and, and using Scrum in that way? I know uh, you being from the Netherlands, uh, Scrum is used in pretty much everything there from school to building birdhouses and everything in between. Uh, do you have any experience and any any suggestions on using Scrum uh, outside of IT? Um, yeah, first to pick up on that, that Netherlands bit, I think that's actually a burden these days rather than a, a uh, than something really nice because it's mostly the word Scrum that's become mandatory which makes it much harder to filter out where where one like me would actually fit and where not. Um, but yet to take Scrum outside of IT, well, um, yeah, I think I've, I've never really understood that question because it comes quite natural to me. Um, it isn't all that 
different to me. Uh, the main thing to first realize, of course, is that this, this word developer for development team, um, that was taken from the context of research and development. So if you have research and development, then whatever you develop, you're on a development team. doesn't matter whether it's a new product to service, a marketing campaign, um, something in a classroom setting, anything. You're, you're developing something new rather than producing more copies of something already in existence. Um, so that's the main thing to realize. And, and lots of other things. Flex, I think. It, it, um, yeah, I love Scrum because it, I, in my opinion, it really is helpful for dealing with complex situations. Um, and by complex, I, I mean that there's a certain level of uncertainty in there that you cannot meaningfully uh, take out up front. Uh, and then that's where all these feedback loops, Scrum is basically a set of feedback loops and some other things around it to really make the best of these feedback loops where well, these shine. And those are valuable in any, uh, in any complex setting. And we have many of them these days. It doesn't really uh, need IT or specifically shine in IT. Yeah, that, that, that's excellent. We're, we're seeing, you know, if, yeah, if, I do feel like I might be evading the question a bit. So if that needs a follow-up question to specify what outside IT means in this context, then I'll, I'll be happy to have that show up later. Excellent. Yeah, and you know, we're we're seeing Scrum Scrum used Scrum, Scrum is there to help people deal with complex problems and complex okay. situations. Yeah. Um, we 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 actually have a webinar coming up where um, some folks are talking about how they're using Scrum to help with their children who are suffering from ADHD uh, because that structure and, and the planning and, and the knowing has become so important uh, with their children that, that they're using Scrum as a way to, 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 to know what they're trying to achieve and also because things change constantly to, to introduce that change more more easily, so so you know we're we're seeing Scrum used in, in in so many ways and so many facets because it is a simple process. It's not um, it's not an IT process. That's just where it was born out of. Yeah. So when I'm in an organization, I myself am mostly in, involved with with well organizational change, transformation in some form, and I tend to automatically apply Scrum to that as well. It's also a non IT thing. Um, we've been the most, most formalized version of that. I was a product owner for a team of coaches for about a year. But the only problem with our use of Scrum was that it broke the internal tooling. It couldn't handle how we did Scrum. It wasn't standardized to, to the IT angle enough. Oh, well, then, then we use our, our big whiteboard. We're happier that way anyway. And the mandatory uh, a huge monitor that every team had we turned that around, so we broadcasted informational uh, messages to the everybody passing by in the major hallway that we were next to. So, right. sold. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next question, Elizabeth asks. Uh, so the, the the sprint backlog. Um, I, I get. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. Uh, so. Liza is getting pressure from her company and, and people within her organization that the sprint backlog is very strict and they must follow whatever they define in planning to be developed and delivered during during the sprint from that sprint backlog. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're saying you really can you shouldn't change the sprint uh, and you shouldn't change the sprint backlog once you're out of planning, which goes against, of course. Um, like what the Scrum Guide even says, which is you just need enough to get started and it goes against empiricism because we're going to learn throughout the sprint and have to adjust. So do you, do you have some recommendations and subject, so suggestions for Liza on how to work with her team uh, and work with, with her work within her organization to better help them understand that the sprint doesn't, the, the, the entire sprint backlog doesn't get defined necessarily during planning and it can't change? Right, and they're, they're having a problem dealing with reality in, in that sense, or, or yes. giving it some space. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking immediately of, of the sprint goal. I mean, the, the, the core of, the, of a great sprint backlog is the goal that you're trying to achieve. And indeed, that goal shouldn't change. That's in the Scrum Guide. Um, so yeah, I'm, that's, that's the thing that I would immediately be looking into as, as deeply as I can. Can we have great 
create sprint goals here that make it clear that this is what we're achieving this sprint and that we are indeed not deviating from our goal that we're just adjusting to what we learn along the way but still doing the exact same thing we agreed on great um, yeah and i think even just one of the things i've seen some of our trainers do is that they they always have printed copies of the scrum guide and they'll hand them out and, and share them with the team to sometimes just overcome wrong perceptions um the, the, you know, the great example is this question um in the scrum guide it very clearly says that um, you just need enough to get started um in the scrum guide it talks quite a bit about you know not knowing what might happen as you do work and, and changes that may be required. So um, I think I think there's definitely opportunities to to have those discussions. Yeah, I think also um, what might help is to to try and help these people truly understand what this this com word complex complex adaptive problems what that what it actually means um, try to set them into a into a situation that they could not predict them their way out of um, if you if you're able to get them to to do that it can be a very small and simple uh, uh, simple exercise uh, they might have a, you might have some little bit of reference like hey this is why we're doing that and, and it's not a flaw that we're uh, not fully predictable it's a result of our environment and actually making the most valuable uh, outcome for you rather than uh, doing as was planned based on incomplete information definitely thank you so our next question uh paul asks so what advice would you have for a new product owner uh, so that they don't end up becoming just a scribe or a proxy Okay, so I will. Um, I just mentioned that I was product owner of a team of uh, coaches for about a year. When I was made product owner of that team, the manager there, he was pretty pretty good as, as in terms of ag agility. He said to me, uh, "Look, um, I have two types of product owners here. Some have a vision, and some actually deliver, and and they're both useless to me. I need one that does both. Um, so yeah, the scribe is probably one that delivers." Uh, work on your vision, figure out what the product should be about and try to get uh, to work with the stakeholders on that and to, to start um, getting the trust that you were able to embody that product on their behalf. Um, that's one part of the answer. The other part is not as optimistic. The answer is also often in my experience, you can't. Um, and let me explain that. If you're in a, in a position uh, where the team needs a product owner, you're appointed to be that product owner, though you've got little seniority or, or organizational awareness going for you, you're maybe even an external hire to just do the job. Um, it might be hard for you to truly get the trust from the business to be that uh, budget holder, the sponsor to be ultimately be that entrepreneur that we would love the product owner to grow into because you've just um, you just came from the wrong place in the organization and it's very unlikely that they're really able to uh, to give you that hat that that will take years and years that you don't might not have. So if that is your situation then I hope you can be uh, content with finding the proper product owner and they'll probably be still be happy with you and happily appoint your product owner of the next team to do that trick a couple of times again and again. Um, so yeah, those would be my uh, my answers to that. Thanks, Wim. Uh, so here's one. This is actually a really good question. I'm not sure I've, I've seen this before, but it makes a lot of sense and um, as people try and, and need to grow. How do you balance time which development team members spend on the sprint backlog versus on personal development? Uh, should should those things be part of the sprint backlog or how, how do you deal with personal, personal development um, improvements uh, that the team and the, the people on the team are trying to have as well? Yeah, so I, this is, 
a fight in organizations or no it isn't even a fight it doesn't just doesn't happen in many organizations that i see that even the ones that take um that take all this stuff very seriously um and i would say it's not it's partially about truly personal um growth you can at some point start asking whether that belongs in the in the work atmosphere but if we're talking about growth in in directions that are useful to the organization growth as an organization including the members of the teams um yeah i'm, I'm surprised how hard it is to get attention for that we were talking about uh, getting the um uh, the one improvement action on the backlog at least this this seems to be even harder and i have um worked with um yeah within an organization where we would then found a team because it, it, if you're if you're coaching and if you need to reach a lot of teams it's it's always better to find what's already happening in the organization the bright spots as, as it's called in the, in some theory and highlight those and we found one bright spot one team was really doing really nice things and then when it came to sharing that with other teams they said well no we just don't have the time for that a product owner won't won't let us do that and that was that was truly surprising to me how far that went because it's like okay we just let every team here reinvent the wheel at a huge expense that's very very um uh, suboptimal um so yeah i think that the longer term answer to that is to to train these these people that set these boundaries further in and help them understand and help them align with what the organization need needs it, it also relates to me to uh uh, something we we work with in the product owner training that, that we tend to see that there's sort of a gap somewhere between it what the team is doing and what it wants and and organizational goals so it can often be that product owners don't are sort of operating in a bit of a vacuum they don't have a clear uh, um, a clear idea of how their work and their products contributes to the organization as a whole which also makes it very hard to retire products when it's that time. If you're just fighting for my product, my product, more and more and more, then how will you make the sensible decision to retire or to give space for something new? Um, so yeah, I think that is definitely uh, an important thing to look at. How well are these these teams and these people that that have problems with finding this space? How well are these these aligned to the longer term goals of the organization? And could you perhaps help improve that alignment so it becomes a more natural thing to spend time on growth of the organization, which mainly means the people in it? Great, thank you. So uh, the next question, I think uh, you haven't done Scrum if you haven't had to uh, deal with this, or you probably haven't ever been on any team <laughs> outside, in or out of Scrum if you haven't had to deal with this. Uh, how do you deal with a bossy development team member uh, or the ones who uh, have the habit of deciding for the whole team? Um, yeah. I don't think that has a recipe, but in general, the, the, the elements to it are finding ways that um, make it uh, easier for others to also pitch in, which can be in facilitation formats that start with uh, everyone putting in an equal amount of, of ideas and then filtering them out. It's much harder to grab the, the microphone there full time if the format is just set up totally against that. Um, it's also much easier for, for someone to stick to his guns and say you, you first got a minute to think about it for yourself, you've then been discussing it with a team member already, uh, maybe even with, with four people and only then you bring it into the, into the whole group, then, then by then you've, you've, you've grown quite fond of your idea, you've also learned that some people actually liked it, etc. Um, and then if say we had a team of eight, so we bring two of these groups of four, uh, together then it, it's already much harder to totally uh, remove the the input from whomever happens to be the other four that were not in the dominant uh, dominant half uh, so that's i think that's an important uh, thing um, another thing um, that i tend to work with a lot is to ultimately confront the person with how that just doesn't scale if one person wants to control the team, basically do the work for the team in terms of deciding, that's, that's just the same, the, exactly the same things apply, why we prefer not to have an external manager do that. At some point, you'll be the bottleneck. And, and you, you, uh, you should, most of these people do this out of uh, 
feeling of uh, deep responsibility for things and they don't want to be the bottleneck if you can if you do confront them with that fact they might be open to find ways in which they would be less of a bottleneck which automatically would leave more space for others to uh, have meaningful uh, input so that's just two ideas i think uh, i'll leave it at that for now great thank you so uh, is it true that the Scrum Master role disappears eventually if Scrum, once their Scrum teams become mature? Uh, ah, yeah, again, I, I, I regret that I'm the only one uh, visible on this screen because a couple of years ago, I moved to the house that I'm in currently. And it gave me a great example because I actually live right next to a soccer coach. And this particular soccer coach won the, the Dutch championship with his, uh, his team at some point. So did they fire him after that? You don't need a coach anymore, right? You're, you're, you're at the top. I guess you, you can all guess the answer to that. They didn't, you don't fire the coach of the winning team. And there, there's a couple of reasons for that. First, you might just set yourself new and greater targets, which in football would mean you go international. Uh, another thing is there's always, always more to do, more to learn, and, and there's always change coming your way. The team might change, the other teams you compete with might change, so there's definitely always more to do. Um, so no, in general, you, you, you won't completely grow beyond having a Scrum Master, and it's also great to have someone to challenge you again, especially if you're growing into this sort of slur of, hey, things are much better than they were, and, and this is, but, but at some point that's the new normal, and, and why wouldn't you be able to, to grow out of that again, or why would it become a problem uh, uh, if situation changes? Um, it doesn't mean that, that the Scrum Master's role stays exactly the same. I think it should change all the time. And it might also, the focus on, on how much time is, is, uh, is spent uh, on or with specifically with the team or on or with the product owner, or on or with the larger organization, these things may vary over time, definitely. Uh, but I would not say that the team stops having a scrum master at some point. That that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, we're we're always learning. We're always improving. If we're always yeah. improving, we, we we need that help. We need that guidance. Um, it's also it, just a, a law of nature that if we don't uh, actively stand against it, then chaos will grow or results will go down. Things will happen that will make the old situation less desirable. For some reason, since some of the previous questions, Kodak is now firmly on my mind. You know, they were the master of film, and at some point, film just became obsolete. You know, if they and apparently they didn't have a good scrum master in the, uh, around at that point to to realize and, and and make them aware of these changes because they've become uh, irrelevant as a company over that. Yeah, and I, I even think you know it, it goes even deeper than than that as well. Uh, there are always impediments coming up one in, in one of the roles of the scrum master being to protect the team uh, well, yeah. I could I, I might I might argue against this because the way I like to define an impediment is that it's something that is outside of the team's self-organizing capability to solve so if you, the more mature a team becomes the more able they they might be to self-organize around a lot of things so in that sense, one could argue that hopefully the Scrum Master is less needed over time. Have never been in that situation. I would say there are plenty of very hard to tackle problems left then that the Scrum Master could dive into. Um, because there is some more time because they can afford to just pick up one of the really hard problems and start working on that, on that impediment. But Theoretically speaking, I'm saying, well, that one might lessen over time, actually. But. And that makes sense. And, I, and I've worked with Scrum teams. Uh, I think of even actually one of the first uh, organizations, it was an insurance company that I worked with, where our, our Scrum masters would initially be with one team. As that team matured, they'd be able to be Scrum masters for, for two teams um, as the teams matured. And, and that they they were able to to span a little bit, but they still were very much needed even a year and a half later as those teams matured. One, because the teams were still changing, right? People come, people go. Um, organizations evolve and change, but also um, th there's always those outside pressures in the Scrum Master being very important to help protect around some of the outside pressures that some of the questions that have come up already today um, that, that, that we talked about too. 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily argue that a Scrum Master always needs to be a full-time job for any one team. So, you know, one team, Scrum Master per team, full-time, and, and that's it. I, I think we, we have, because we are Scrum.org, we have no credibility on the matter. It's like we are saying that, yeah, 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 you have to produce value, but you, you should have lots of, lots of Scrum Master. So that, that's also for you to find out where the value of the Scrum Master is. Uh, but keep your eyes open for that. There is plenty to find, and it's definitely valuable to have Scrum Masters around in your organization. Yeah, definitely. So uh, moving on to the next question. Um, when considering joining a new team, what questions might you ask uh, the team to better understand where they are um, with Scrum, uh, what level of support they have from their leadership and so on? Are, are there things as you've joined Scrum teams that maybe some good questions or good things to think about? Gosh, I'm sure that if you throw me into a team or, or ask me to start working as a, as a coach with them, I'd ask some very interesting things, but somehow no one comes to mind right now. <laughs> uh, what, well, I think I would be probing a bit about uh, understanding, and understanding the, 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 the mindset, understanding the values, understanding what complexity really means, why feedback loops are so important, and trying to see uh, whether they pay lip service to some things, to some terms that they may or may not have understood, or whether they actually uh, live the live the spirit of of this uh, of this stuff, I think that's that's what I mostly would want to uh, would want to try and find out. Um, how would you do that? Well, you can. We had the review versus demo thing, and what a demo then <laughs> uh, means or doesn't mean. That's an easy one to hear. Um, uh, you could also simply ask to attend one of the dailies and just observe and see what's what's said there. Is it is it mechanical or is it is it a real collaboration that you say, oh wow, yeah, now they're definitely uh, one step closer to reaching that sprint call because because they had this short meeting. Yeah, I think there, there there's a lot of a lot of questions that certainly can be asked. Um, especially around if, if you're work, talking to the scrum team the scrum team members about what real support they're getting um, from leadership uh, is it is it business in usual as usual and you're going through the motions or, or are you really empowered as a team are you really um, enabled to work together as a team I, I think there's a lot of things that I've seen um, when going into different organizations that that some quick questions can can certainly expose as well I'm, I'm, yeah personally i'm not too sure how quick those questions would be because you don't have the frame of reference that they have they might consider them very empowered compared to something you don't know about or something they were in previously while to you it's totally not etc so um, um yeah i i, I think it I, th I think I would try to observe as much as possible. And maybe then, uh, for example, I said, be on a daily. You could also be in a review and see how their, their interaction with the stakeholders actually is, or in a refinement and see how their in interaction with the product owner actually is. Um, I think that'll give you, if you can afford that amount of time, give you much more information than, uh, uh, than a few quick questions can. Yeah, I think, I think that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so here's uh, here's one. Uh, this is probably a quick one. Once you've set your sprint goal, do you write it somewhere? Do you put it on a board? How, how do you communicate that sprint goal, and how do you make it in, uh, to stay top of mind and visible? Yeah, you would definitely put it somewhere. I'd love to have it. I've, I'm still a fan of the physical boards if I can get away with it, and I would definitely have the sprint goal uh, prominently featured for that sprint. And um, it's it's uh, yeah one of the things that you might just want to reiterate a couple of times, perhaps in 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 the first, uh, uh, especially in the first couple of dailies. If you're if you're kicking them off, then I, I, I want to point to it. So how uh, how we're doing towards, and then actually read out uh, achieving. Uh, I don't know the ready set for this uh, fair that's that's happening in two weeks time. Definitely call it out. I mean, we want to uh, we want to be very much aware that that's our goal. 
But I'm, yeah. I mean, yeah, how is it? I think the question is too detailed. It depends on whatever uh, means you have available. But, but yes, make it visible, make it transparent. It's very important. Exactly, and it's it, it's great to. I know for for us, we always put our sprint goal right on our board. Um, we use a virtual board. Um, we use Trello, uh, but we always have our sprint goal there, so we can refer back to, and it's always top of mind. Uh, so, so this is a good one. We've actually had some 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 webinars on this and other things. Uh, but how do you bring in other parts of the organization to to understand? Um, Scrum and, and, and what everyone's doing. Um, specifically here, they ask, you know, how do you bring sales, marketing, finance, and others into Scrum um, and not just, you know, just the IT team? So how do you get these other folks involved? Should they be on the Scrum team? Should they be uh, um, outside of the Scrum team? Any thoughts? Um, I'd love to have them on the Scrum team. But of course, the, what, what's, what's this possible step at a given time in a given organization? Uh, for some for some reason, by the way, um, perhaps because Scrum has been associated with IT so much, I see many organizations that make that next step and then, then they rename their Scrum teams to uh, squads at that point. They don't stop doing Scrum, fortunately, but apparently to bring these new roles in, you need a new name for the team that isn't IT infected. I hope we can disinfect the word Scrum from that IT context for, at some point because it, it's somewhat undeserved, I think. But Nevertheless, I'm mentioning this because if you want to Google for information, it would, it would definitely help you to look into, uh, into the squads of various organizations. Um, so do you want them on? Well, I think the, the first step is to get them interested by uh, through the results that you're creating. So that's through your reviews, having them there, having the concrete results, uh, seeing that when they act as a stakeholder and put something in that actually matters, that they can get it done in a, uh, in a, and truly done in a reasonably fair amount of time, quite unlike it might have been in the past. Um, and then, yeah, indeed, the next step, if it, if it makes sense, if you're able to find uh, uh, teams around products or services, definitely, why wouldn't you want to do the whole thing? Because um, I said before that the, the, what you truly gain from it is, to, is in the extent that you're able to adapt. And you still have all these dependencies with, with parts of the organization that are working in older, much generally much slower ways, which enable them to adapt far less or at least far slower. Then there's definitely something to gain if you if you make a Scrum team that's that's all about your product, sales, marketing, um, IT, um, you name it. You did name it, Eric. I'm missing one of the ones you named, but <laughs> put them all in. Why not? If you can. Yeah, and uh, I know we. Uh, Dave Dame, uh, one of our professional Scrum trainers, uh, he, he had done a webinar on uh, specifically around bringing marketing in to the Scrum team uh, and, and talks a lot about how, how can you deliver a done product if if you don't have the people who are going to bring it to market uh, as part of that team and in, in, in part of it, but it, it goes across the entire team, I think. I think you're very right, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, um, and it, so here, there's a lot of. Again. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on it a little bit. There's there's often a lot of um, uh, struggle with the authority of the various parts. You know, only sales can decide about sales. Only marketing can decide about marketing. So then you do need people of each of these uh, uh, departments on your team to get that going. And it might might be like that for a long time. I've personally been on the Scrum team uh, for a while. That was that was generally around 14 people and and which was obviously not ideal and, and we teach that in scrum and we felt it and and there's been attempts to split it a couple of times and they always came back together uh, but the main reason for that team size there was that it needed people from uh, from the hierarchical departments to function so you needed two people from the finance department to work on the, the finance part of the finance programming part of it and you needed two people from the marketing sales department to to do their uh, uh, their bit uh, because otherwise or actually you would need one but we didn't want to depend on a single person ever so we always had two pretty much um, so you needed links into all these departments and the organization was very slow to catch on to that so that is a situation that has lasted for for years with a too big a scrum team that was nevertheless the most effective thing that they were able to find in that organizational context 
And as I said, it split a couple of times every, and it was together for a year and it was, this is too big, we split it. And then they found out that they were so dependent on the other half of the team that they just put it back together again, or they didn't even, it just organically happened at some point. Excellent, thank you. So uh, this one, uh, Sergio says, newbie question, but I'm not sure this is a newbie question because I think it comes up quite often. I know I see it in the, the scrum.org forum quite a bit. Um, why oh, is so that? Google the answer, that's nice. <laughs> Give me why, a minute. Why? Yeah, there you go. So why is backlog refinement um, not considered a formal event in the scrum guide? Ah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, again, this is one I love to, to do, uh, spar a bit about if it, someone would ask it in class. But, uh, you know, the, the, the characteristics of these events are that they really have a really fixed place in the sprint. Um, so there's, that's one thing at one place in the sprint. And refinement doesn't. And it's actually not a great idea to do all your refinement as one, one, one all-hand session somewhere in the sprint. It's, it's more organic than that if you want it to be truly effective. So uh, it, it, the short answer is because it's an activity and not a, uh, that you do throughout the sprints and not a, uh, an event in the sense that it has a fixed place and a fixed setting of people who are there and that's it. Excellent. And I actually, um, th this question has come up quite a bit and uh, this is another one that I've talked to Ken Schwaber about and um, because people have asked, even it's come up in the uh, user voice for, hey, you should add this as a formal event in, in Scrum. Yeah, so, and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so That's, there's also this guideline that you should probably count on 10% of your sprint going to uh, to refinement. So uh, does it mean that you have a meeting 10% of the sprint length size? Well, definitely not, I would say. I, I think I can't, I mean, there's probably the odd case where you can make it work, but. For most teams, that's not ideal. <clears throat> you need to you need to have some team members go out there, gather some information, do some thinking, do some coming up with technical options or whatever, and then you come back together again with some more people, or maybe the whole team, or just a product owner, or whatever is suitable at that point, and you spar around. So this has ever mixing groups of people, and yes, ultimately you will you will have parts in that involve the whole team and whole team thinking, but. But I see too many of these meetings uh, where, where there's just someone typing in their uh, big screen up with the, uh, with the backlog on it and there's someone typing in that tool and, and everybody is, is geared towards what the next word should be. And it's just it's such an unproductive use of the, of, the, of the refinement time. It gets you so little for so much investment. That, that, yeah, it's, it's very, very deeply justified that it's not, not an event that would set, send a completely wrong message. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and Ken's very simple answer was, does every scrum team always have to do refinement? And his, his simple answer is no. There are scrum teams and product owners that are very good at clearly defining their PBIs um, as they go and refinement isn't even necessary or smaller scrum teams who they're just constantly refining and, and, and having these conversations. To, so to make it a formal event would, yeah. would now make it a, a, a formal thing and, you know, this is about, Scrum is about uh, being a framework and not making everything a we must. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm mostly with that latter group, I think. I think that the, the, the situations in which it's so simple to define your backlog, well, okay, good for you, but it's not that interesting to me. But the situation where you can just do it organically in small chunks and go along, I think that is a very good way to refine. And, and most refinements, I think, uh, happens in, in could happen or should happen in that way even that, that gets you a lot and yes that might mean that you still have a refinement session somewhere or it might not maybe your sprint planning is enough to then to then do that syncing i don't know or other organic moments where you have the whole team together for a brief moment to just do that that syncing on what whatever is going on together it's 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 yeah, so as Ken very rightly said, it's just no good to make it a formal, you shall do this here in the sprint. It doesn't help. Yeah. So I think we have probably time for one or two more. Um, this has been great. Uh, here, here's one uh, certainly that we've heard many times. Uh, if you want to create an agile environment, do you need to change the traditional organizational design or do you think uh, we can start building an agile environment without changing the entire organizational design? 
Yeah, so I think the strength of Scrum is that apparently you could, I think what, why Scrum is so popular is that you could, you, if you were able to find one uh, endeavor, one product, one, one service somewhere in your organization that is uh, meaningful enough to get attention when you create some results, but not that uh, under that much pressure that you're you're unable to to do or change anything that you could and still can if you have that that option uh, wheel in Scrum start doing it and thereby start influencing your your organization. Um, so yeah, in that sense, you 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 can do it and you can start. And uh, uh, yeah, I also think it's very hard to give give an, an answer to this because what you're able to do so much depends on where your organization now is both in terms of how it functions and what sort of culture and mindset it has and in terms of what needs it has how how open to change they might be because they're either curious or, or have a burning platform um, but I do like also the, 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 the on the other end of the spectrum this uh, I have this book here on my on my desk card the open space agility and um, their thought is very much to just open it up as far as possible, as quickly as possible. So that's writing that edge of chaos that I, that I talked about. So they would definitely uh, uh, want to make changes around, uh, around the software teams. Um, organization structure is it on the table there. To some extent, there's actually some other people who made a spin-off where explicitly organizational structure is on the table. Um, but um, what good is it if I say, yes, you have to? because quite often you will be unable to and then you got nothing so i think there are many situations in which you are able to start without changing too much organizational structure and build from there and that is the reality that most of us are in so yeah we can theorize about what it could be and 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 it only gets you so far because before we know it we would be designing from from some some scratch paper or some lovely uh, theory a, a nice organization while at the same time we we are saying oh wait a minute in this uh, complex environment with all these uncertainties there is just no way to analyze a way out so don't do that if you're going to change the organizational structure please find an organic way to to make those changes to bring the people in and have them make most of those changes themselves yeah i, I think you know i i often talk about it's it's an agile transition, not a transformation. It, it's it's nearly impossible to just transform your entire organization. There's there's pushback. There there's things in place. There's regulations potentially. There there's governance. There's so many things that come into play. Um, but I, I think you said it perfectly, talking about how we can transition. Let's start at a team level. Or let's start at a product level, and, and, and one prove some success, but also not not be so disruptive that we're just going to flip the entire organization um, over because that just that's just not realistic. Yes, I'm reminded of one particular organization where I was involved in an agile transformation and it was in that kind of stage where that meant that you had a project manager who managed the transition and you brought in a lot of coaches and there was a plan and I actually got some clout there because I got to coach the team before the plan existed so I wasn't bound by anything I got results and then I was somewhat untouchable mm -hmm. Um, but uh, um, the thing there was that um, they needed a plan, no doubt about it. There would have been no budget without that plan. Nothing would have gotten off the ground. Uh, but when the plan and the reality and the options that were there started to deviate, I, I tried to have this conversation with the project manager and said, look, you needed this plan to get the budget. Um, but they'll be quite happy if you produce results of at least the predicted value uh, rather than stick to the plan. And he liked that thought initially. I mean, because what we see is if you, if you follow up on a plan, the, the best you can generally hope for is that you get the predicted result. Never any better, usually uh, less because somewhere the plan doesn't exactly match reality and your result is not as great as you wanted it to. So, so yes, if you need a plan to get started, sure, but then try to get uh, to, to switch to that mindset of, okay, but if I'm at least producing the value that was in this plan under the current circumstances, given the learning we've, we've done, then it should be good. Um, unfortunately, I was there was a very hierarchical setting, and I was officially a lower level coach in the structure, so my access to the manager was relatively limited as well. And and ultimately, over the course of two years, he he, he dug in his heels, and then uh, got unceremoniously the whole thing got got got, got. the project got cancelled, the the transformation got declared complete, etc. 
pretty much because the plan and the reality were by then so far apart that there was nothing further to be done with that plan. And yeah, I think that was a sort of a sad result. Great. Well, thank you, Vim. Uh, we're, I want to be conscious of our time box and we're just about at the hour. So um, I, I want to say thank you to the audience. Uh, Vim, uh, thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, I think this has been quite insightful, certainly for me and I'm sure for our audience. Uh, continue your learning. Check out the uh, scrum.org learning paths. Uh, there's learning paths for the different roles. Your, your, your learning never stops. It, it should always keep going. Lots of free resources and, and things on the website to, to help you keep doing that. And uh, please come back, please follow us. And uh, with that, uh, Wim will take the, the questions we didn't get to and um, get back to you hopefully via email. And uh, be safe everybody and have a great day. Thank you, Wim. Have a great day, it was fun.